Section 2 of Journal of the Plague Year by Daniel Defoe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. Section 2 It was now mid July, and the plague, which had chiefly raged at the other end of the town, and, as I said before, in the parishes of St. Giles, St. Andrews, Colburn, and towards Westminster, began to now come eastward towards the part where I lived. It was to be observed, indeed, that it did not come straight on towards us, for the city, that is to say, within the walls, was indifferently healthy still, nor was it got then very much over the water into Southwark, for though there died that week one thousand two hundred and sixty-eight of all distempers, whereof it might be supposed above six hundred died of the plague, yet there was but twenty-eight in the whole city, within the walls, and but nineteen in Southwark, Lambeth Parish included, whereas in the parishes of St. Giles and St. Martin's in the fields alone there died four hundred and twenty-one. But we perceive the infection kept chiefly in the out-parishes, which, being very populous, and fuller also of poor, the distemper found more to prey upon than in the city, as I shall observe afterwards. We perceived, I say, the distemper to draw our way, that is, by the parishes of Clerkenwell, Cripplegate, Shoreditch, and Bishopsgate, which last two parishes, joining to Aldgate, Whitechapel, and Stepney, the infection came at length to spread its utmost rage and violence in those parts, even when it abated at the western parishes where it began. It was very strange to observe that in this particular week, from the 4th to the 11th of July, when, as I have observed, there died near four hundred of the plague in the two parishes of St. Martin and St. Giles in the fields only. There died in the parish of Aldgate but four, in the parish of Whitechapel three, and in the parish of Stepney but one. Likewise, in the next week, from the 11th of July to the 18th, when the week's bill was one thousand seven hundred and sixty-one, yet there died no more of the plague, on the whole southwark side of the water, than sixteen. But this face of things soon changed, and it began to thicken in Cripplegate Parish especially, and in Clerkenwell, so that by the second week in August Cripplegate Parish alone buried eight hundred and eighty-six, and Clerkenwell a hundred and fifty-five. Of the first, eight hundred and fifty might well be reckoned to die of the plague, and of the last, the bill itself said, one hundred and forty-five were of the plague. During the month of July, and while, as I have observed, our part of the town seemed to be spared in comparison of the west part, I went ordinarily about the streets, as my business required, and particularly went generally once in a day, or in two days, into the city to my brother's house, which he had given me charge of, and to see if it was safe. And having the key in my pocket, I used to go into the house, and over most of the rooms, to see that all was well. For though it be something wonderful to tell, that any should have hearts so hardened in the midst of such a calamity as to rob and steal, yet certain it is that all sorts of villainies, and even levities and debaucheries, were then practised in the town as openly as ever, I will not say quite as frequently, because the numbers of people were many ways lessened. But the city itself began now to be visited too. I mean, within the walls. But the number of people there were indeed extremely lessened by so great a multitude having been gone into the country, 
and even all this month of July they continued to flee, though not in such multitudes as formerly. In August, indeed, they fled in such a manner that I began to think that there would be really none but magistrates and servants left in the city. As they fled now out of the city, so I should observe that the court removed early, that is, in the month of June, and went to Oxford, where it pleased God to preserve them, and the distemper did not, as I heard of, so much as touch them, for which I cannot say that I saw they showed any great tokens of thankfulness, and hardly anything of reformation, though they did not want being told that their crying vices might without breach of charity be said to have gone far in bringing that terrible judgment upon the whole nation. The face of London was, now, indeed, strangely altered. I mean, the whole mass of buildings, city, liberties, suburbs, Westminster, Southwark, and all together. For, as to the particular part called the city, or as well as to everybody else, it was a most surprising thing to see those streets, which were usually so thronged, now grown desolate, and so few people to be seen in them, that if I had been a stranger and at a loss for my way, I might sometimes have gone the length of a whole street, I mean of the by-streets, and seen nobody to direct me, except watchmen set at the doors of such houses as were shut up, of which I shall speak presently. One day, being at that part of the town on some special business, curiosity led me to observe things more than usually, and, indeed, I walked a great way where I had no business. I went up Holborn, and there the street was full of people. But they walked in the middle of the great street, neither on one side or the other, because, as I suppose, they would not mingle with anybody that came out of houses, or meet with smells and scent from houses that might be infected. The inns of court were all shut up. I do not mean shut up by the magistrates, but that great numbers of persons followed the court by the necessity of their employments and other dependencies, and, as others retired, really frighted with the distemper. It was a mere desolating of some of the streets. But the fright was not yet near so great in the city, abstractly so called, and particularly because, though they were at first in a most inexpressible consternation, yet as I have observed that the distemper intermitted often at first, so they were, as it were, alarmed and unalarmed again, and this several times, till it became to be familiar to them, and that even when it appeared violent. Yet, seeing it did not presently spread into the city, or the east and south parts, the people began to take courage, and to be, as I may say, a little hardened. It is true, a vast many people fled, as I have observed, yet they were chiefly from the west end of the town, and from that we call the heart of the city, that is to say, among the wealthiest of the people, and such people as were unencumbered with trades and business. But of the rest the generality stayed, and seemed to abide the worst, so that in the place we call the liberties, and in the suburbs, in Southwark, and in the east part, such as Wapping, Radcliffe, Stepney, Rotherhithe, and the like, the people generally stayed, except here and there a few wealthy families who, as above, did not depend upon their business. It must not be forgot here that the city and suburbs were prodigiously full of people at the time of this visitation, I mean at the time that it began, for 
though I have lived to see a further increase, and many throngs of people settling in London more than ever, yet we had always a notion that the numbers of people which, the wars being over, the armies disbanded, and the royal family and the monarchy being restored, had flocked to London to settle in business, or to depend upon and tend the court for rewards of services, preferments, and the like, was such that the town was computed to have in it above a hundred thousand people more than ever it held before. Nay, some took upon them to say it had twice as many, because all the ruined families of the royal party flocked hither. All the old soldiers set up trades here, and abundance of families settled here. Again, the court brought with them a great influx of pride, and new fashions. All people were grown gay and luxurious, and the joy of the restoration had brought a vast many families here to London. I often thought that as Jerusalem was besieged by the Romans when the Jews were assembled together to celebrate the Passover, by which means an incredible number of people were surprised there, who would otherwise have been in other countries. So the plague entered London when an incredible increase of people had happened occasionally, by the particular circumstances above named. As this conflux of the people to a youthful and gay court made a great trade in the city, especially in everything that belonged to fashion and finery, so it drew by consequences a great number of workmen, manufacturers, and the like, being mostly poor people who depended upon their labor. And I remember in particular that in a representation to my Lord Mayor of the condition of the poor, it was estimated that there were no less than an hundred thousand ribbon weavers in and around the city, the chiefest number of whom lived then in the parishes of Shoreditch, Stepney, Whitechapel, and Bishopsgate, that namely about Spitalfields, or, that is to say, as Spitalfields was then, for it was not so large as now by one-fifth part. By this, however, the number of people in the whole may be judged of, and indeed I often wondered that, after the prodigious numbers of people that went away at first, there was yet so great a multitude left, as it appeared there was. But I must go back again to the beginning of this surprising time. While the fears of the people were young, they were increased strangely by several odd accidents which put together, it was really a wonder the whole body of the people did not rise as one man and abandon their dwellings, leaving the place as a space of ground designed by heaven for an akeldama, doomed to be destroyed from the face of the earth, and that all that would be found in it would perish with it. I shall name but a few of these things. But sure, there were so many, and so many wizards and cunning people propagating them, that I have often wondered there was any, women especially, left behind. In the first place, a blazing star or comet appeared for several months before the plague, as there did the year after another, a little before the fire. The old women and the phlegmatic hypochondriac part of the other sex, which I could almost call old women too, remarked, especially afterward, though not till both those judgments were over, that those two comets passed directly over the city, and that so near the houses that it was plain they imported something peculiar to the city alone, that the comet before the pestilence, was of a faint, dull, languid color, and its motion very heavy, solemn, and slow, but that the comet before the fire was bright and sparkling, or, as others said, flaming, and its motion swift and furious, and that, accordingly, one foretold a heavy judgment, slow, but severe, terrible, 
and frightful, as was the plague. But the other foretold a stroke, sudden, swift, and fiery as the conflagration. Nay, so particular some people were, that as they looked upon that comet preceding the fire, they fancied that they not only saw it pass swiftly and fiercely, and could perceive the motion with their eye, but even they heard it, that it made a rushing, mighty noise, fierce and terrible, though at a distance, and but just perceivable. I saw both of these stars, and, I must confess, had so much of the common notion of such things in my head, that I was apt to look upon them as the forerunners and warnings of God's judgments, and especially when, after the plague had followed the first, I yet saw another of the like kind, I could not but say God had not yet sufficiently scourged the city. But I could not at the same time carry these things to the height that others did, knowing, too, that natural causes are assigned by the astronomers for such things, and that their motions, even their revolutions, are calculated, or pretended to be calculated, so that they cannot be so perfectly called the forerunners or foretellers, much less the procurers of such events as pestilence, war, fire, and the like. But let my thoughts and the thoughts of the philosophers be, or have been, what they will. These things had a more than ordinary influence upon the minds of the common people, and they had almost universal melancholy apprehensions of some dreadful calamity and judgment coming upon the city, and this principally from the sight of this comet, and the little alarm that was given in December by two people dying at St. Giles, as above. The apprehensions of the people were likewise strangely increased by the error of the times, in which I think the people, from which principle I cannot imagine, were more addicted to prophecies and astrological conjurations, dreams, and old wives' tales than ever they were before or since. Whether this unhappy distemper was originally raised by follies of some people who got money by it, that is to say, by printing predictions and prognostications, I know not. But certain it is, books frighted them terribly, such as Lily's Almanac, Gadbury's Astrological Predictions, Poor Robin's Almanac, and the like. Also, several pretended religious books, one titled, Come out of here, my people, lest you be partaker of her plagues, another called Fair Warning, and another Britain's Remembrancer, and many such, all or most part of which foretold directly or covertly the ruin of the city. Nay, some were so enthusiastically bold as to run about the streets with their oral predictions pretending they were sent to preach to the city, and one in particular who, like Jonah to Nineveh, cried in the streets, Yet forty days, and London shall be destroyed. I will not be positive whether he said it was forty days, or yet a few days. Another ran about, naked, except a pair of drawers about his waist, crying day and night, like a man that Josephus mentions, who cried, Woe to Jerusalem, a little before the destruction of that city. So this poor naked creature cried, O oh, the great and the dreadful God, and said no more, but repeated those words continually, with a voice and countenance full of horror, a swift pace, and nobody could ever find him to stop or rest, or take any sustenance, at least that ever I could hear of. I met this poor creature several times in the streets, and would have spoken to him, but he would not enter into speech with me or 
any one else, but held on his dismal cries continually. These things terrified the people to the last degree, and especially when two or three times, as I have mentioned already, they found one or two of the bills dead of the plague at St. Giles. Next to these public things were the dreams of old women, or I should say, the interpretation of old women upon other people's dreams, and these put abundance of people even out of their wits. Some heard voices warning them to be gone, for that there would be such a plague in London so that the living would not be able to bury the dead. Others saw apparitions in the air, and I must be allowed to say, of both, I hope without breach of charity, that they heard voices that never spake, and saw sights that never appeared. But the imagination of the people was already turned wayward and possessed. And no wonder, if they who were pouring continually at the clouds saw shapes and figures, representations and appearances, which had nothing in them but air and vapor. Here they told us they saw a flaming sword held in a hand coming out of a cloud, with a point hanging directly over the city. There they saw hearses and coffins in the air, carrying to be buried. And there again heaps of dead bodies, lying unburied and the like, just as the imaginations of the poor terrified people furnished them with matter to work upon. So hypochondriac fancies represent ships, armies, battles in the firmament, till steady eyes the exhalation solve, and all to its first matter, cloud, resolve. I could fill this account with the strange relations such people gave every day of what they had seen, and every one was so positive of their having seen what they pretended to see, that there was no contradicting them without breach of friendship, or being accounted rude and unmannerly on the one hand, and profane and impenetrable on the other. One time, before the plague was begun, otherwise than, as I have said, in St. Giles, I think it was in March, seeing a crowd of people in the street, I joined with them to satisfy my curiosity, and found them all staring up into the air, to see what a woman told them appeared plain to her, which was an angel clothed in white, with a fiery sword in his hand, waving it, or brandishing it, over his head. She described every part of the figure to the life, showed them the motion and the form, and the poor people came into it so eagerly, and with so much readiness. Yes, I see it all plainly, says one. There's the sword, as plain as can be. Another saw the angel. One saw his very face, and cried out what a glorious creature he was. One saw one thing, and one another. I looked as earnestly as the rest, but perhaps not with so much willingness to be imposed upon. And I said, indeed, that I could see nothing but a white cloud, bright on one side by the shining of the sun, upon the other part. The woman endeavored to show it me, but could not make me confess that I saw it, which, indeed, if I had, I must have lied. But the woman, turning upon me, looked in my face, and fancied I laughed in which her imagination deceived her too, for I really did not laugh, but was very seriously reflecting how the poor people were terrified by the force of their own imagination. However, she turned from me, called me profane fellow, and a scoffer, told me that it was a time of God's anger, and dreadful judgments were approaching, and that despisers such as I, should wander and perish. The people about her seemed disgusted as well as she, 
and I found there was no persuading them that I did not laugh at them, and that I should be rather mobbed by them than be able to undeceive them. So I left them, and this appearance passed for as real as the blazing star itself. Another encounter I had in the open day also, and this was in going through a narrow passage from Petty France into Bishopsgate churchyard, by a row of almshouses. There are two churchyards to Bishopgate Church or Parish. One we go over to pass from the place called Petty France, into Bishopgate Street, coming out just by the church door. The other is on the side of the narrow passage where the almshouses are on the left, and a dwarf wall with a palisado on it on the right and the city wall on the other side, more to the right. In this narrow passage stands a man looking through between the palisados into the burying place, and as many people as the narrowness of the passage would admit to stop, without hindering the passage of others, and he was talking mightily, eagerly to them, and pointing now to one place, then to another, and affirming that he saw a ghost walking upon such a gravestone there. He described the shape, the posture, and the movement of it so exactly that it was the greatest matter of amazement to him in the world that everybody did not see it as well as he. On a sudden he would cry, There it is! Now it comes this way! Then, Tis turned back! till at length he persuaded the people into such a firm belief of it that one fancied he saw it, and another fancied he saw it, and thus he came every day, making a strange hubbub, considering it was in so narrow a passage, till Bishop's Gate clock struck eleven, and then the ghost would seem to start, and, as if he were called away, disappeared on a sudden. I looked earnestly every way, and at the very moment that this man directed, but could not see the least appearance of anything. But so positive was this poor man, that he gave the people the vapours in abundance, and sent them away trembling and frighted, till at length few people that knew of it cared to go through that passage, and hardly anybody by night on any account whatever. This ghost, as the poor man affirmed, made signs to the houses, and to the ground, and to the people, plainly intimating, or else they so understanding it, that abundance of the people should come to be buried in that churchyard, as indeed happened, but that he saw such aspects, I must acknowledge, I never believed nor could I see anything of it myself, though I looked most earnestly to see it, if possible. These things serve to show how far the people were really overcome with delusions, and, as they had a notion of the approach of a visitation, all their predictions ran upon a most dreadful plague, which should lay the whole city, and even the kingdom, waste and should destroy almost all the nation, both man and beast. To this, as I said before, the astrologers added stories of the conjunctions of planets, in a malignant manner, and with a mischievous influence, one of which conjunctions was to happen, and did happen, in October, and the other in November, and they filled the people's heads with predictions on these signs of the heavens, intimating that those conjunctions foretold drought, famine, and pestilence. In the two first of them, however, they were entirely mistaken, for we had no droughty season. But in the beginning of the year a hard frost, which lasted from December almost to March, and after that moderate weather, rather warm than hot, with refreshing winds, and in short, very seasonable weather, 
and also several very great rains. Some endeavors were used to suppress the printing of such books as terrified the people, and to frighten the dispersers of them, some of whom were taken up. But nothing was done in it, as I am informed, the government being unwilling to exasperate the people, who were, as I may say, all out of their wits already. Neither can I acquit those ministers that, in their sermons, rather sank than lifted up the hearts of their hearers. Many of them, no doubt, did it for the strengthening, the resolution of the people, and especially for quickening them to repentance. But it certainly answered not their end, at least not in proportion to the injury it did another way. And indeed, as God himself, through the whole scriptures, rather draws to him by invitations and calls to turn to him and live, than drives us by terror and amazement, so I must confess I thought the ministers should have done also, imitating our blessed Lord and Master in this, that his whole gospel is full of declarations from heaven of God's mercy, and his readiness to receive penitence, and forgive them, complaining, Ye will not come unto me, that ye may have life, and that therefore his gospel is called the gospel of peace, and the gospel of grace. But we had some good men, and that of all persuasions and opinions, whose discourses were full of terror, who spoke nothing but dismal things, and as they brought the people together with a kind of horror, sent them away in tears, prophesying nothing but evil tidings, terrifying the people with the apprehensions of being utterly destroyed, not guiding them, at least not enough, to cry to heaven for mercy. End of section 2